If you're not going to preach about the return of Jesus Christ now, I don't think you ever will. Because we are seeing so many prophetic signs, so many things happening. Um, we did 10 of these, we've done 10 of these uh, 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 messages so far. And one night we tackled, uh, I think it was transhumanism and the gender issue. You know, you can be any gender you want, so, so they say this. I've seen 16 or so different ones, and they reckon there's a list of, I don't know, it's just one lot. But anyway, we went home that night, and very kindly, 60 Minutes had a special on that night on gender changing and all this. And I don't believe everything 60 Minutes say, by the way. Um, you want to be careful with But that was very good when we do that. Then we did a session on artificial intelligence uh, a couple of months later, and they were kind enough again to run a series that night on Amoka. She's the um, most advanced humanoid robot in the world. And I just want to share this as a testimony. I went over to Rome and England a little while ago. My son was getting married in Rome. And my other son lives in Cornwall in England. And uh, we've been preaching about this thing. We mentioned Amaka. She's the, this female. Oh, she, it's, it's an it, really. But it's dressed up as a female. It's called facial expression. So I went and uh, spent some time with my son in Cornwall, and he, he said to me, oh, Dad, our, our neighbours are having drinks, they've invited us over, would you like to come? And I said, yeah, I would. Well, it turns out this guy works in the factory that builds these Amaka robots. And uh, after we got talking, he said, oh, would you like to come and meet her? I think he called it it, but it's like a, it's like a female. So anyway, two days later, I get over to Amaka, and um, uh, she was very charming. You know, it's just but it was very charming and sort of gets you in a bit. I found it quite interesting. And, um, I asked, I said, do you know any jokes? And she said, oh, yes. Uh, what do you call a robot who likes to joke around? A funny bot. It's mm -hmm. not very good joke. <laughs> and she read me, she told me a poem, but it was sort of thing. But here's the thing. I went halfway across the world and God connected me with this robot, which we've been teaching on. Mm -hmm. And I'm not so... It was, it was fun to meet the robot. But the thrill for me is not knowing and meeting this robot, it's, it's knowing the one who can do anything. Mm -hmm. And I, I know God can do anything, but that just blew me away. I thought, here I am in the middle of Cornwell, in the middle of nowhere, it's a beautiful place, but in the middle of nowhere, and God connects me with this robot. And, you know, we have a conversation. God is amazing. He can do anything in our lives. He can coordinate any situation at all if we'll walk with Him. So I just praise God for that. God is a wonderful God. He can do absolutely anything. I'm still amazed at that. You know, meeting him, it was, it was fun, but it's not the, the thrill of my life. The thrill was that God can connect us at any time. He can do anything. Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to get into this. You can see from the the title, What in the World is Happening? And I think there's a lot of people that are really frightened at the moment. Um, even Christians are scared because of what's happening. And um, we're seeing the greatest global uh, security challenges since World War II at the moment. That's true. In Europe, we're seeing the Ukraine war. Isn't it interesting? I haven't heard anything about the Ukraine war for weeks now. And it was on the television every night. I hardly hear anything. So that's Europe. In the Indo-Pacific, we have China, and we all know what's happening there. China is arising as a major uh, concern, a major superpower. In the Middle East, of course, we have the Hamas and the Israeli thing happening now. So there's a lot of unrest. We're going to look at a few scriptures today, so uh, you might need to concentrate a bit. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 the angel appeared to Daniel, and Daniel was really freaked out by everything he saw. He saw all these visions of the end times, and he, he just couldn't relate to it because it was just beyond anything he, he knew, and he actually got sick. And he asked the angel, can you explain these things to me? But the angel said, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. In other words, put it in the archives for now because nobody will understand it. But at the time of the end, it's going to make sense. And I believe we are at that time of the end. And he says this, very telling, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. We are living in the, in, in the arena or the, 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 the era 
where people are running to and fro, you can jump on a plane and be in Joburg tomorrow morning if you want to. You can go anywhere in the world very quickly. That's what that means, running to and fro. And knowledge shall increase. We, we have seen an explosion, an utter explosion of knowledge over these last uh, 10 years, 20 years. And here's the thing. We, we spoke about this in our own church a little while ago. The next explosion is quantum computing. The Chinese have a quantum computer. It works on, it's, it's not like just getting your, your, your car, uh, getting your Volkswagen and putting a turbocharger on it and you know, making it go faster. This is a whole new deal. This is a whole new type of computers. The Chinese one works on light, but they're saying it's 180 million times faster than the fastest supercomputer in the world. This, this, is, this is mind blowing. Um, so when we couple that with AI, artificial intelligence, we're going to find we're living in a different world when they're, they're already using quantum computers. It's a totally different technology. But knowledge is increasing at such a rapid rate, it's becoming scary. And even the people that are responsible for the AI that are developing it, they're worried about it. You've probably heard the news about that. Um, this topic came into prominence about November and December last year. And starting, starting to blow out. So that's where we are. I believe we're firmly and squarely living in the end days. I want to read to you from Jesus. Out of, uh, Jesus said this in Luke 21. He spoke to them a parable. He said, Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all things take place. And you might say, well, what are you talking about fig trees and trees? The fig tree is symbolic of, and most people agree on this, I think 99% agree, the fig tree is Israel. When we see the fig tree budding, we saw the fig tree budding on the 14th of May, 1948. Um, amazing time that this, this nation was rebirthed. That was when the fig tree budded. And Jesus said that generation will not pass away until all these things, all these end time events happen. Now, there's been a lot of argument and conjecture over that. I don't know exactly how to take it, but I would say at least the oldest person that was old, the, the, maybe the, the babies that were born at that time when Israel came back as a nation, perhaps the oldest person still alive when Jesus comes back. I, I don't know how to take that. Some people say a generation, they said, oh, it's 40 years old. Years to pass, he hasn't come back. But I'll tell you what, he's coming back soon, and it's not far, it is not far away. Isaiah 66, verse 8 Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Israel was born overnight in, on the 14th of May, 1948. It is the greatest miracle since the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, 2,000 years ago. And it's, it's, we need to watch it. You see, because Israel is the time clock. And when the Jews are back in the land, God's prophetic time clock starts ticking. And it stopped in AD 70. The Jews were taken out of the land. A million were, were killed, many crucified. There were so many crucified that you couldn't find timber in it timber around that region, and 70,000 male slaves were taken back to Rome at that time. Then the Jews were dispersed across the earth, to the four corners of the earth. But in 1948, God brought them all back. Amazing, amazing miracle that happened. So that time clock started, God's prophetic time clock started ticking on May 14, 1948. Tick, tock, tick, tock. We are in the times of the Gentiles, but that time is soon to end. How long? I don't know. Jesus could come back this year. There's nothing as far as I know stopping. No other prophecies to be filled as far as I understand. Now, let me say this. I know that people differ on their views of Bible prophecy, but for me the important thing, and maybe you might differ a bit on what I, I, I bring this morning, but the important thing is that we see the scriptures, we see the big milestones, and when we see those milestones happening, we can know 
that God is on the move and things that when the time is short. And I think that's an important thing to remember as we go through this this morning. Okay. Zechariah 12, 2 to 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness or reeling to all the surrounding peoples when they lay sin against Judah and Jerusalem. It shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all the peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. God said, He said, I'm going to make, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup of real. In other words, everyone who picks up that cup are going to be like they're drunk. And if you look around the earth at the moment, we are seeing more focus on Israel than ever before, since, since the end of the Second World War. It's everywhere, everywhere. And anti-Semitism is on the rise in a major way. I want to show you a few things. Remember the, um, the Sydney Opera House, the rally there, which became violent. They were burning the Israeli flag. There's just a couple of photos there. Um, anti-Semitism has not been seen like this since the, literally since the 1930s, and it's across the earth. Uh, this is just something I was... You know, Europe has been letting, uh, bringing people across their borders for a long time now, and it's really starting to pay off. And I thought this was a good little quote. You can avoid reality, but you cannot avoid the consequences of reality. So you can pretend it doesn't exist, but there are consequences. And you see this guy, he's, he's, paint, he's painting the, the Muslim image over the stars of the, um, the European Union. This is in this is uh, in Poland. This this was a major rally. This lady is holding a placard that says, "Keep the world clean, throw the Jews in the trash can." And you see that the Star of David there. This one here is in um, well, it's happening in Paris, Berlin, London, and Moscow. They are marking Jewish homes like they used to do in the Nazi era. We've never seen this before. I've not seen this in my lifetime, not to this scale, anyway. So they're going around and painting stars or Judah, Jude, on the on the houses to identify. This is happening all over the world at the moment. I, I pray it won't happen in Australia. So anti-Semitism is on the move. Have you ever wondered where that Semitism comes from? Shem. Remember, Jew, the Jews originated from Shem. He was one of the sons of Noah. So they were Shemites or Semites. That's where that word comes from. Uh, I just read that again. I just want to say this. If you're looking for a simple uh, explanation of many of these things, Jimmy Evans is very good, I find. Uh, he's one of the guys I go to. It's simple, uh, easy to follow, probably easy to explain. I think he explains it far better than I do. And I thought this was a very good quote. He said, I believe a person's disposition towards Israel shows you where they are at with God. That's very true. You see people, some people just react out of ignorance, okay? But for a lot of people, their response to Israel shows you where they are with God because anti-Semitism is not a belief, it's a spirit. It's a spirit, it really is. And this thing that's sweeping the world at the moment, it's not rational, it doesn't make any sense. It's a spiritual thing and it's a spirit that's driving this thing. So that's a, I thought that was a good quote. The FBI is, I'm just giving you a bit of an update on where we're at, I'm sure you all know it. FBI are warning now in America of growing dangers of Hamas-inspired terrorist attacks coming from all these people that stream. These people have been streaming across this border for the last couple of years, and there are terrorists cells coming into them. So, you know, I pray that won't happen, but the FBI are concerned, and that's that's a very strong possibility. Okay. We're in a time where we're in a time of the alignment of nations. Nations are aligning themselves. Jesus spoke of sheep and goat nations. And we're seeing different nations, even within Australia, we're seeing an alignment happening. We pray that that won't happen here. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, He will sit on the throne of His glory. He's talking about the final judgment, the judgment seat of and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he said, he says to these people on the right hand, he said, these were the sheep, he said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. 
And they said, we, we didn't see you, Lord. We didn't do that. And he said, when, when you did it to the least of one of my brethren, you did it to me. He's talking about same thing applies to Christians too, but the, the context of that verse is he's talking about Israel. So God is going to judge the nations of the earth on how we treat Israel. And at the moment we have a great alignment happening. They're polarizing, going one way or the other. There doesn't seem to be much middle ground. People are either, you know, pro-Palestinian, you know, what were they saying in Sydney uh, a few weeks ago, gas for Jews. They were chanting, right? I was just staggered at that, amazed. So this thing, this is a big deal, what's happening at the moment. It's a big deal. Let's, um, let's just, uh, just do a bit of a recap on right where we are at now. On the 22nd of September, Benjamin Netanyahu got up in the United Nations and he said, we are very close to signing a peace treaty with Saudi Arabia. That's a major thing. That was major. Then on the 7th, and Benny Hinn got on the night, we, we actually played his video. He said, this, this is a major event, and God is going to bring, it's 50 years since the 1973 war in Israel. He said, every 50 years something happens. And what you know, be assured that if something major happens in Israel, there'll be something happening on God's time clock. Um, 1948, the healing revival hit the world. Oral Roberts, Kenneth Hagen, Many of these men uh, and women, Catherine Coleman, amazing miracles, a move of God. In, um, in 19, uh, oh gee, I forgot my dates there. When was the, um, the Six Day War? It was 1967. The charismatic renewal came across, spread across the earth. Millions of people swept into the kingdom. And I, I came to the Lord on the tail, well, quite a bit on the tail in the, in the 70s. That was the charismatic movement. In 1973, we saw the, uh, what was it, the, um, gee, I'm sorry, I don't know this quite well, I just can't think of it. Um, anyway, 1973, we had another war in Israel. Yeah. Yom Kippur, thank you, thank you for that. We had the Yom Kippur War. Christian television was really worth that year, and Christian television has seeded the earth for the gospel since then. So every time there is a major event in Israel, something's happened. I believe we're, on the, we're, we're about to run into a major revival across the earth. And that's what we're preaching, that's what we're, we're aiming for. So on the 7th of Netanyahu told the United Nations we're on the verge of a Saudi peace treaty. So Hamas weren't too impressed with that and they said, well, we're going we're to rule this party. And then on the 7th of October they invaded Israel. Um, and butchered about 1,400 people on that same day. Uh, the death toll, 1,400 dead roughly in Israel. I think there's about 25 soldiers killed so far this week, I think that is. You, you can't keep up with the statistics. The 3,500 injured in Israel, 242 hostages, the last count I heard. And the Palestinians, I think that it's hard to know what the real death toll there is, but they're saying up to about 9,000. Um, and I think I, I'll just spend a couple of minutes on this uh, because I think you know it all. Uh, the Gaza Strip is a strip about 40 kilometers long by about 15 kilometers wide, something like that. It's a small piece of ground. Two million people live in that area. There are 1,300 tunnels underneath that area, um, and they range from some may be under shallow, but many of them range from 30 to 50 metres deep. I mean, these are deep tunnels. These are tunnels that are going to be bomb proof. I don't know if they have bombs that will go that far. Underground, they're saying there's probably 20,000 terrorists housed. Also, the hostages are housed underground in these, in these tunnels, as they call them. We have Hezbollah, which is another terrorist group on the, on the north end of Israel, southern Lebanon, who are now have been sending missiles and bombs into there. They haven't got involved fully. They have about 50,000 troops. But this whole thing, I'll be honest up front, I don't know exactly how this is going to pan out. But what I want to do this morning is just present the scriptures because I think if you if you understand the scriptures and the countries, you'll see the, the markers. The markers are, 
uh, on, in time and understand where we are where we are at. So what I'm going to do is we're going to look at Psalm 83. Um, and many people have differing opinions on this. I believe it's a, it's a war that's, it could be what we're in now. But I'll just read it to you. Do not get a psalm of Asaph. Asaph was a prophet. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult. And those who hate you have lifted up their head. Please note, when people come against Israel, he's saying here that they hate God. Okay, does that make sense? They actually, their hatred is towards God first and then Israel. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation. You see, um, Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, are puppets of Iran. Iran is calling the shots and supplying the money and the weapons. There's also Russia involved as well. But, um, their, main, their aim is to cut off Israel from being a nation. They want to obliterate Israel from the earth. And they're, they're very upfront about saying this. You can find it very quickly on the internet. So come and let us cut them off from being a nation. So the war that this is talking about is about people who just want to obliterate Israel, <laughs> that the name of Israel may be remembered no more, for they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. So it's talking about nations all coming together to form a confederacy, a group of people in common agreement, we're going to get Israel. We're going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And he goes through the tents of Eden, the Ishmaelites. I, I won't read all that out, but I'll just go to the next slide. You can see all those names there. Um, just very quickly, tents of Eden, that is the displaced Palestinians and southern Jordanians, Ishmaelites and Saudis. Moab, Palestinians in Central Jordan, Hagarites, that's the Egyptian because Hagar was from Egypt, remember? Uh, Ammon, Palestinians and Northern Jordanians. Amalek, Arabs in the Sinai area, Philistia. Philistia is Hamas. Philistine, the word uh, Palestine comes from the word Philistine. The Romans named that because they wanted to destroy Israel. That was when they, they cast them around the earth. Inhabitants of Tyre, that's uh, southern Lebanon, Hezbollah, they're living. Notice it says the inhabitants, it, because Hezbollah are, are living there, they've set up a base there, but not all of them are from that region. Does that make sense? The Bible's very explicit. Here it says the tents of Edom. That talks about people that are displaced. It talks about people that are living in temporary accommodations. And that's, that's the displaced Palestinians. Then we have Assyria, which is the Syrians and northern Iraqis. Just to note, Jordan and Egypt have treaties with Israel at this point in time. So this whole thing is so fluid. We don't know exactly, I don't know if anybody knows exactly how it's going to turn out, but if we understand what nations are involved, we will be able to see. So Jordan and Egypt at the moment have got a treaty with Israel, and the Saudis were on the verge. They're, they're trying to become fairly neutral in the whole thing. We'll move on. Um, this is a map from a guy called Bill Salas, who's a very good reference on this material. And he summarized it this, in this way as the inner circle of fire. You see, all those nations that we talked about, they're on the borders of Israel, or very close to the borders. So these are all those who hate Israel. These are the ones that want to wipe Israel off the map. And you can see here that they are all surrounding Israel. It's the inner circle of nations. I won't go through and read the, the names again, but you can see that. Um, Psalm 83, back again, verse 9. Deal with them as Midian, as with Sisera, as with Jaden and the brook Kishon, who perished at Endor, who became as refuse on the earth, like their nobles, so on and so on. Who said, let us take for ourselves the pastures of God for a possession. That's the motive of this, is to destroy Israel and to take the land. They want the land. They want to kick Israel out of the land. The Palestinians want the land of Israel. Now, some people say, um, even Amir Safati says, that oh, this war's already happened. But the thing is, he says that all these nations got together in 1948. But the thing is, he says here, deal with them as Midian. When God dealt with Midian, they never again opposed Israel. That was the end of them. 
When God dealt with Sister and with Jacob, they never again rose. And I believe that's what this is saying. This is different. These countries have attacked Israel time and time again, but they've never been stopped. Okay, so perhaps this is the time that they will be. Um, so that inner circle is what's, what's coming at this time. So let's just move on. The big war that people talk about is in Ezekiel 38, and it's called the Gog Magog War. And I don't know, I think a lot of people will be familiar with that. Basically, Russia is going to come from the north, and it's fairly explicit the language. It's going to come down from the north and invade Israel and going to bring others with them. Now, we'll just read this, and uh, I'm sorry, there's, there's a bit of information here, but we'll just try and summarize it as we're going to make it as simple as possible. There's a, a bit to get your head around. Son of man, set your face against God, the land of Magog. Gog is a person, Gog means a prince. He's the prince of the land of Magog. Uh, he's the prince of Rosh, Mishesh, and Tubal. That's Russia and some of its ex-Soviet states, the stands. And prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against you, O God, the prince of Rosh, Meshesh, and Tubal. If this war was to happen tomorrow, then uh, God would be Putin. Now, I don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but we'll talk about that in a minute. That would be him if it happened in the near future. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses, horsemen, all splendidly clothed, we have to remember when the prophets saw these things, they'd never seen tanks, they'd never seen aeroplanes, they had no they had no reference point to describe this thing. So he's, he's described it as an army of horses, there may be horses, but I doubt it. I will turn you around the hooks in your drawers and lead you out. So God himself is going to bring Ezekiel 38, the, this war to pass. Um, and then he names the nations, Persia, Tehran, Ethiopia, and Libra, Libya are with them. All of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togama from the far north, and all its troops, many people. Uh, prepare yourselves and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be visited, in the latter years you will come into the land of those who brought you back from the sword, and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which have long been desolate. They were brought. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. That's talking about Israel. Israel's been brought out of the nations, back into their land. The greatest miracle since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is a key for this. And now all of them dwell safely. This says this three times in this passage. They're dwelling safely. Well, Israel is not dwelling safely at the moment. They are just not. So this. This is not the Ezekiel 38 war today, but it could evolve into it. And that's the thing. I don't think anybody, maybe some people know it, I certainly don't, but we present the scriptures and we can see the, the milestones. So, thus says the Lord, on that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages to a peaceful people. Again, there's that, that phrase, peace. This comes at a time when there's peace in Israel. Who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates. And this is a key to take plunder and to take booty. We said the motive of the Psalm 83 uh, confederacy, their motive is to take the land and to obliterate Israel. They don't want it, they want to obliterate every Israelite off the face of the earth. But this is a different war and has a different motive. Their motive is to take plunder and to take booty. In other words, they want to take the goods of the land. You know, Israel in the last several years has a major gas field discovered in the Mediterranean. They have I can't remember the statistics, but they have enough, enough gas to power Israel for another hundred years and supply gas into Europe. Now Russia don't like that. That's going to affect, you know, they're, they're an energy seller. That's really going to affect them big time. So one of the reasons that this, the main reason is to take booty. And I think it would be to contract, take control of the land and take those gas fields would certainly be one of them. Um, sheep at the dam, the merchants of Tarshish. And so that's their motive. Their motive is to take booty and plunder. Sheep at the dam, the merchants of Tarshish.
harsh, you should all the young lions to say to you, have you come to plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take livestock? So that it's very clear it's about taking the plunder. Therefore, son of man, say to God, on that day, when my people dwell safely, he says it three times, you can't, we can't mistake it. It's at a time of safety in Israel that, this, that Russia is going to come down from the north. Um, then you will come out of your place, out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. It's worth us noting the end of this war is a giant earthquake and God rains fire and brimstone out of heaven and destroys these armies. Major, uh, God, God wins the battle for Israel in this thing. We won't go, we won't go there, but I just want to look at the nations, so this is very important. And if you don't remember anything, remember the main players in this war. Um, God is a prince. Magog, Russia, and you know, 99% of people agree on this. You have to go back and study the, I haven't studied the ancient history, but I, I go to people who have. And, um, Rosh, Mishesh, and Jubal, former Soviet states, the stands, I, I can't remember which ones they are, I'm sorry, but you know, there's a Catholic state, but all these different stands there. Um, Persia is Iran. It was only, I think, in the, was it the 70s that per, uh, Persia changed its name to Iran? Um, the Islamic Republic, Republic of Iran. Uh, Ethiopia is Sudan. Libya is Libya. Goma could be Germany or could be part of Eastern Europe, not sure. Togama is Turkey. The three main players here, the big ones, are Russia, Iran, and Turkey. And we're going to have a look at them and see what's happening. Now, this is very interesting. The countries that are not involved, these are the ones that said, hey, what are you doing? Why are you invading them? They're questioning them, they're opposed to it, but they don't take strong action. Sheba, Persian Gulf nations, Dedan, Saudi Arabia, and that makes sense. Saudi are pulling back and they're not, they're not getting involved. The merchants of Tarshish, this was England, and the, they, had, they had a lot of trade with India too, that sort of region, England across to India. Um, neighbors of the Persian Gulf nations, and this is very interesting, all their young lions. You see, England is the lion. The, the symbol of England is the lion. The young lions would be America, come out of England, um, parts of Europe, uh, Australia, Canada, New Zealand. They're the young lions. So there you go, we haven't mentioned in this, in this war. But we're standing back and challenging them and saying, hey, what are you guys doing? But they're still going to continue. So the three big players to remember here is Russia, Iran, and Turkey. And we're going to see it coming together. What I said, this is the alignment of nations that's happening right now. Now we looked at the inner ring, which was the nations, their motive is that they hate Israel. They want to destroy them. They just have a hatred for Israel. And they want the land. The Bible says the pasture, and that's what we're after. The, the Palestinians... Uh, will never live in peace with the Israelites, despite the fact that Israel has made as many concessions as possible. The Palestinians just want all the land. That's it. It's, that's the only thing they're going to be satisfied with. That's their motive, to take the land and kill the Israelites. The Israelites. This, this is what uh, Bill Salas, I, I like what he said, the outer ring, these are nations that have come from far away. You see that? Uh, Persia was involved in the first one, Iran. But here we have Magog up around Russia. Um, all these other lands are going to come down and march on Israel. This is a totally different war to what we described in Psalm 83. Is that, is that making sense? Yeah. This is an outer ring of countries that are much further away. Much further away. Okay. Um, I've called these, these the three amigos. Um, we shouldn't really make light of them. You've got to have a bit of a laugh. Um, <laughs> In 2022, 19th of July, uh, Vladimir Putin flew to Tehran, where he met, he met with the president of Turkey, uh, Erdogan, and the Iranian president, Rassi. Um, so you can see there that photo says it all. There's strong ties between these three nations. So God, is, God said thousands of years ago this was going to happen. It was unimaginable. And you know, even 10 years ago, it was hard to imagine because Turkey is a NATO partner. And when Erdogan took over as president, he has radicalized the nation to uh, it's become a radical Muslim, and far more so. 
And um, now he is not a friend of Israel, and he's siding, he's still a NATO partner, but he's siding with Iran and Russia, which is a very strange term. So it just tells me, you know, the Bible tells us things that are going to happen and we look at it. Like who would have said that Israel would come back as a nation? They were scattered across the earth. But if the Bible says it, God has been 100% right so far. And I have no reason to think that he won't be 100% right with the rest of the prophecies as well. Um, on the 26th of October, Moscow House hosts Hamas delegation and Iran's deputy foreign minister. So that was only, what, uh, last couple of weeks ago when this thing started. Straight away, Russia brought Hamas and Iran's foreign minister over. So you can see the alignment here of the nations. That's what we're, that's what we're talking about there. Um, on the same day, Erdogan, who is the president of Turkey, he quoted, he's quoted as saying, this is a couple of weeks after the massacre in, in Israel. Hamas is not a terrorist organization, but a liberation group, a group of mujahideen, which means holy warriors, that is fighting to protect its soil and citizens. So this thing is flushing everybody out. It's, seeing, it's locating people. It's polarizing people. We're seeing really where nations are really at. As I said before, it's separating the sheep and the goat nations. I pray that Australia will remain a sheep nation. Praise the Lord. So where are we at in this whole thing? And this is a timeline that we put together. Um, whoops, excuse me. This is the 70 weeks of Daniel, but I just want to simplify by saying this. This is the 2,000 years of the church age here. And I believe we are right here, about a minute to midnight. Down here we see uh, 1948, Israel rebirth, 1967, Jerusalem liberated. Now we are at this point, knowledge and travel are increasing as we said, there's, a, there's a, a, a knowledge explosion. Now I know people teach differently on this, but I believe the rapture will happen before the tribulation starts. I believe we are on the verge of, of being raptured, the Lord coming back for his church and then we go into the tribulation and so on. But you know, it's time to get ready. Jesus could come back this month. He could come back next year. It could be 10 years. It could be, I, I don't know. But I don't believe the world can continue as it is indefinitely. We are very close to the return of Jesus. I remember I had a dream about two years ago. And I was with my family. And we had this big table of food. And my father came in and he said to us in a very serious tone, whenever I see my father in a dream, usually that means it's God the Father speaking to him. You know, dream, dream symbols and so he said, he looked at me and, he, and everybody and he said, get dressed quickly. The wedding's in 30 minutes. Mm. So we are, we are living in a time, the time is short and it's exciting in a way. We don't, it's terrible to see people killed and all this sort of thing. It's horrible. But um, we are living in a time where Jesus is coming back. I want to draw your attention to two other prophetic events. Now, I, I hear people say this is going to happen here, this is going to Honestly, I don't know. But I know they're going to happen. And when they happen, that's when I'll know. And it's a bit like the rapture, you know. Some people think it's going to happen in the middle of the tribulation. I believe it's going to happen before. But on the way up, we can talk about it, can't we? <laughs> <laughs> discussion on the way up. <laughs> you know, we'll be in a glorified body, so we won't be pointing fingers and say, oh, I'll try to do it. But, uh, yeah, we'll, just be, we'll be so happy we won't care. But uh, anyway, praise the Lord. Two other prophetic, major prophetic events. The first one is the final destruction of Damascus. Now, I don't know exactly when this is going to happen, but the Bible says it's going to happen. I'm sorry that you missed out that line a bit there. Um, Damascus is one of the oldest inhabited uh, cities on earth. It's never been, it, it's been, uh, it's been partially destroyed, but it's never been fully destroyed ever. It's always been rebuilt. Uh, Isaiah 17, we're just going to skim through. Uh, Isaiah speaking says, the burden against Damascus bombs, God speaking through the Holy Spirit. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city and it will be a ruined city. So the language is very clear. There's going to come a day when Damascus will cease. It's gone close. 
never ceased. It's always been rebuilt, but it's going to cease. In that day, the strong cities will be as, as a forsaken bough, and an, an uppermost branch which they, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. So Israel is going to destroy Damascus. There's going to come a day. And the reason I bring this up is, remember, it's going to happen. I don't know when. It could be in the near, I, I suspect it will be in the near future. But I don't know. But when it happens, you can look and say, aha, God said that was going to happen. The whole Isaiah prophesied it. And then it says this, they're going to be taken out by Israel because, because of the children of Israel. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning, he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us and the lot of those who rob us. And this is the way I read that. Overnight, we're going to get up in the morning and we're going to hear what we did, what happened in Israel. We get up in the morning and hear this terrible news of these uh, babies and women and children, old people being brutally, horrifically murdered in ways I wouldn't even like to talk about here. But something's going to happen to Damascus and we're going to get up and we're going to hear on the news that Damascus is no more. It's been obliterated. It's been bombed. It's gone. So that's one to look up. That's just an, an event that we need to be conscious of and looking for. Um, I heard Jimmy Evans say he believes, he believes it's going to happen amongst what's happening now. I don't know. But it's going to happen. And when we see it, it's another marker for us to understand, wow, the time is short. The time is short. Um, there's some pictures. Uh, Damascus is the capital of the city. It's quite an interesting looking place. Why not? I haven't been there. I wouldn't go there now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't go there for the holidays. <laughs> you want to sunbathe, I'm sure there's better places to go. <laughs> so that's it by night. And that's just a picture of some of the bombings that have happened. It's been attacked quite a few times. Okay. The next one is the destruction of Elam or Iran. Elam is the, is the name for southern Iran. And this is quite significant. Uh, Jeremiah prophesying says, The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam or Iran, southern Iran, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah. So this goes back, this goes back thousands of years. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam. That's very significant. The bow is what launches the arrows. Um, he's going to break the bow. He's going to break their weapon system. And that, that could well refer to rocket launchers. You know, places where you launch missiles from. Because that, that is their bow, is the rocket launchers. And they're in the process of developing, uh, they're very close to developing a nuclear weapon. Against Elam, I'll bring the four winds from scatter them to all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. That's, that's an amazing quote. He's saying there will be no nation on earth. I'm going to scatter the uh, southern Iranians across the face of the earth. There won't be a single nation where Iranians do not go. So something is going to happen in that nation that people are going to flee the land. I, sus I suspect a nuclear, it will be nuclear contamination. I'll just have to go. I was getting out very fast. Now, I don't take the light in any of these things because people are dying and it's, it's horrific. But this is what the Bible takes us. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring, bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord. And I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. I will set my throne in Elam and will destroy from there the king and the princes. So the king and the princes... You see, the Iranian people, the Persian people are beautiful people. It's the, it's the Ayatollahs, it's this, this corrupt regime that, uh, that hate Israel, that love them, that they hate God. They believe they are called to obliterate Israel from the face of the earth and usher in the end times because they have their own theology in the end times, uh, the Iranians. But it shall come to pass in the later days I will bring back the captives of so there's going to come a day where God is going to bring people back into that land. I don't know what that is. That could even be in the millennium reign on earth. I just don't know. But the important thing is to look out for what's going to happen in Iran. And there's a, there's a nuclear power plant down towards the southern end called the Boucher Nuclear Power Plant. Um, they have missiles underground there with... Uh, an eight minute, less than eight minute flight to Israel. 
So they're loaded and ready to go. And that's going to be one of Israel's targets, we, we think. Most people say so. Um, I don't know if you can see that very well, but that's that. this is a map of Iran. That's the bush air plant on the, on the edge of the Persian Gulf. Um, the green things are nuclear research reactors. And the red things, are, the red squares, are enrichment plants. Now, Israel has vowed, um, Netanyahu has said that he, there is no way that he will allow Iran to make a nuclear weapon. They've been saying they've been close for months and months now. I believe they are very close. So if Israel do go in and bomb, they'll, they'll, bomb that, they'll probably bomb that place down there because there's missiles underground. And they possibly, they'll probably bomb these, uh, these enrichment plants up here. But either way, whatever they do, it's very likely that there is going to be nuclear fallout across Iran, southern Iran, Elon, and people are going to flee. So that is another thing which you should be conscious of and looking for. I, I think that one could happen very soon. The problem with all of this is that, and this is the alignment of nations, Russia has said to Israel, Israel have told Russia, we will, we will not allow them to have a nuclear weapon. And Russia has told them, through the United Nations, they've sent the message back time and time again, if you bomb Iran, we will step in, we will get involved. And maybe that's the hook in the jaw, where God says, I'm going to draw you down from the north. You know, we just wait to see how it pans out. I suspect that will be the hook in the jaw. So, we could be very close. This could be on our doorstep very soon. We'll just have to wait and see how it all pans out. Um, so, back to our time chart. Here we are, perched on the edge of eternity. Here we are now. And you know, even without these things happening, we are perched on the edge of eternity. I'm 65, I'll be 66 next month, this month. We are perched on the edge of eternity. You know, I, I trust God that we're going to have long and healthy lives, because that's what his word says. But nobody has a guarantee on their time, do they? You know, we are so close to the edge of eternity, stepping into eternity forever. That's exciting in one way, but it's, you know, we need to be ready. I go back to my dream, often I think of that dream, get dressed, because the wedding is in 30 minutes. The Lord's telling me, you need to get ready, get ready, get ready. We need to get ready. And here we are, the prophetic time clock of Israel has, has hit another milestone, I believe, on the 7th of October. And they, they are going into a full-out war with Hamas. They vow to eradicate them, which I, I think needs to happen because they're just murderers. And we can tell you of the, some of the horrific stories I've heard of. I wouldn't even mention here in polite company. Just disgusting. So that's us there, perched on the edge of eternity. We're right there. Jesus is coming back. We're either going to live out our days and go and be with the Lord, or else Jesus is coming back for us. He's going to rapture the church. The rapture, the teaching of the rapture is very clear in Scripture. We don't have time to go into it this morning. But it's very clear, even Jesus mentioned it. He said, He said there'll be two women at a, at a mill. And all of a sudden, one just goes, vanishes. So you look around, where, where'd they go? There'll be two men working in a field. All of a sudden, one's gone. Two men sleeping in a bed. You're probably brothers or something like that. And all of a sudden, one just vanishes. But when the rapture hits, it'll be the greatest commotion the earth has ever seen up until then because there'll be, I don't know how many Christians there are in the world, all true believers in Jesus that are walking with him. Maybe there'll be a billion people. All of a sudden, they vanish. And uh, the news media will probably say it was the aliens, but um, good riddance because those Christians were a nuisance anyway because they, they wouldn't conform to what we wanted to do. They wouldn't conform to uh, gay marriages. They wouldn't conform to abortion. They wouldn't conform to all these things that we like, we like that we're into. It's going to be the greatest, one of the greatest disruptions to the earth. It'll be, and it'll be terrifying for those who are left behind, for those who are just... Um, warming a seat in the church, keeping it warm, but weren't really looking to Jesus. Jesus said, I didn't know you. That's what he wants. He wants us to know him. And that's the challenge at the moment, is to know him, is to walk with him. Hallelujah. Luke 21, Jesus said, now when these things begin to happen, 
He said, when they begin, we're seeing the beginnings, even just the alignment of nations. Russia, Persia, and Iran is a major alignment. Russia, sorry, Russia, Turkey, and Iran is a major alignment of nations. And all those other nations within that God may God war, they're all basically aligned as well. We don't have time to go into it this morning. But he said, when you see these things begin to happen, we are seeing the beginnings of that may God war. The alignment is happening. Lift up, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Our redemption is drawing near. James says this, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also, well, let's just talk about that. Until it receives. In Israel, they, they wait for the latter rain because that brings the crops to maturity. And I believe we're in a situation now, we're in the, at the time of the earth where we are going to see a latter rain come that is going to bring the harvest to maturity. Does that make sense? We've seen the early rains, we've seen the rain of the Holy Spirit come in many different ways, in many moves across the earth, starting at Pentecost. Uh, and even in the last century or so, the great healing revival, the, the charismatic renewal, all these things. But there is a latter rain coming because I believe Jesus wants to come in and harvest the earth for many billions of people coming to Christ in the kingdom. And I think that's where we're heading. That's what's next. We're waiting patiently for that latter rain. And then he says this, you also be patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. He said that almost 2,000 years ago. He said, establish your hearts because the coming of the Lord is at hand. Well, that was a long time ago. How much more should we establish our hearts now that we are seeing these things playing out real time? We're seeing these alignments coming to pass in real time. Pray, praise God. If you have received Jesus as your Savior, I'm reading Hebrews 10, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. You know, during, uh, during after COVID, many people got used to uh, doing Zoom church. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Zoom church. It's a good thing. But we need to assemble together. Face to face is really good to be able to pray with people, to shake hands, to hug people. To, people need that. We need to be assembling together. And I, I hope not, but I think many people probably backslid. I'm, I'm hearing it. many people probably backslid during that time because they just couldn't be bothered going to church. This is better. I can just, you know, get my hair out of South Church on television and you know, watch the football or, you know, do whatever I want. I can understand that too. I can do that too. So let us consider one another to stir up one of the good works. That's why we need to come together and get together. So important. That's why we organise men's groups and ladies' groups and all these different things. They're so important just to get together and have fellowship and to sharpen each other. Sharpen each other. Uh, the Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man's friend sharpens him. And the same goes for women. We sharpen each other. Praise God. I had lunch with Pastor Patrick last year. It was my birthday in November and we had, we had morning tea up at Malula Bar down in front of the shops there. Because he sharpens me. You know, I, I like to be with him. You know, he tells me things that I'm, I'm not going to come up with. And maybe I tell him things that he might not come up with either. But we can sharpen each other. It's so important for all of us to keep the assembling of ourselves together. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. And I, I believe this morning I'm talking to people. Everybody is born again in this place. But Jesus' emphatic words are, you must be born again. You know, nothing else matters at the end of the day. You know, I, I think there's many people that study, the, the Bible is one of the most fascinating books. To study Bible prophecy is absolutely fascinating. But there are many people who study it just because for the, the thrill and the buzz of learning, you know. But Jesus said you must be born again. That's the important thing. It's good to, it's good to study the Bible. Very important. But we need to be born again. We need to be born again. Remember Jesus said to the Pharisees, He says, um, He says, uh, you, you read the scriptures because you think in them that you have life. But it's they who point you, I can't remember the exact words, they point him to me, but you refuse to come to me. So important the word of God. So important. We need to be born again. 
That's the number one thing. Jesus said to Nicodemus, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time to his mother's womb and be born? He was, his mind was blown. His head's exploded. What are you talking about? Can I go back into my mother's womb and be born again? He had no idea, and I don't think any of us would either if we were there at the time. He had no idea. And Jesus said, most assuredly, in other words, this is really important. I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You see, we're all born of water. When I came out of my mother's uh, belly, I came out of a sack of water. That's what that means. He's talking about people, because it's only people that can enter the kingdom. The angels are already there, but the demons, are, they can't leave it because they, it's, it's mankind. It's those that are born out of water and are born of the Spirit. And he says that, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Do not marvel that I said you must be born again. Praise God. That is the number one thing for people to be born again. That is the number one thing in our generation. People must be born again, and then they need to be they need to be discipled into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. So I'm going to wrap this up. We've talked about some major events happening, and the title of the message is "What in the World Is Happening?" And you could be forgiven for saying that. We're seeing anti-Semitism rise across the earth. I mean, it's, it's quite serious. I heard a story about some, uh, in universities, it's one of the worst places. Um, these people came after the Jews. There was, I don't know how many, maybe a dozen or so. They had to go into a, run into a room and lock the door, and these people were bashing on the door. I heard about, um, I forget which country it was, but a Jewish airline landed, and these people rioted because they wanted to take Jews out of the plane and, do whatever, I don't know. This, is, this has become very serious. It's a spirit. It's a spirit. And unfortunately, we're going to see a bit of it for a little while. What in, the, what in the world is going on? Things are happening on God's time clock. On one hand, we should be very encouraged that Jesus is coming back soon. We also should be encouraged, I believe, it's, it's a major event on the, on the clock of God. We're going to see a major revival. The, the latter rain poured out across the earth, and we are preaching it in our church. We're teaching on it. We're, we're speaking it. We're praying into it. And um, if I could just say this as we close, I believe such a vital thing at this time is prayer. Is prayer. Is building our altar to God. We have a personal altar, a place. It's not a physical altar. It's not made of stones. It's a place where we go. Jesus said, go into your room, shut the door where nobody can see you and pray. And God will reward you in secret. It's a secret place we go and we spend time with him. That's our personal altar. We also have family altars where husbands and wives and families, children come together and pray together. That's another, that's an important altar. That's an altar. And we have the church altar where we come together as believers and we pray and we seek God. I believe we're going to see a mighty move of the Holy Spirit across our nation. But it, it doesn't come cheap. And the price, the price that we pay for that is prayer. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Well, I, I don't know everybody here, so I'm, I'm just going to give anybody an opportunity to respond. You must be born again. You must be born again. If there's anyone here, I just wonder if we could close our eyes. If there's anyone here tonight, this morning, and you've not asked Jesus Christ into your life, now is the time to do it. It is the most important thing. It's the most important thing I've ever done in my life and the best thing I've ever done. I know where I'm heading into eternity. But if you've not done that, you need to make Jesus Lord of your life because things are going to change and people, things are going to get hot. It's the best decision I ever made. The greatest life you can ever have is walking with God. So I wonder if there's anybody here who hasn't received Jesus as their Savior. If you'd like to ask Him into your life, just raise your hand and I'll see that hand. Or if you feel you've, you've walked away and you just need to come back, if you're not 
sure of your salvation, just raise your hand. Praise the Lord. And that's as I feel. I think everybody has done that. So we, we're just going to pray. <laughs> Father, Father, we just love you and honor you today. We open our hearts. We understand this is a time when we need to be very serious about you, about your word, about prayer, about walking our days out with you. So Father, I ask that you would, you would do a fresh new thing in this church, in Coastal Life Church. What a great church, Father. Father, we pray for a mighty move of the Holy Spirit in this place over people's lives. Father, let there come a mighty refreshing of your spirit over lives. Let there come a refreshing of the Holy Ghost over lives today. The Lord, even as we just sit here, as we sit here this morning, just open your heart to Him. Open your heart to Him. Holy Spirit, come. Move in our hearts today. Hallelujah. You know, the Lord will, the Lord will speak to us individually. There are some here this morning, I, I believe the Lord will will say to you, I, I just want to move things around a bit in your life. I want to change some properties. I want to, it's like it's like moving the furniture around in the house. You know, some days I come home and everything's changed. I wonder if I'm still in my, my own home. But it's all been rearranged. God wants to rearrange. There's some rearranging happening in lives today. It doesn't mean you're a bad person or anything. I, I have to get my stuff rearranged quite often. But I believe the Holy Spirit wants to just do some rearranging and some reshuffling, some just reordering things and putting things back. Sometimes in our lives, we, it's like we need a good clean out after a while. Just stuff, just things happening. So Father, today, let your mighty presence rest on people. And Father, let that process continue, a reordering, a reshuffling, uh, just a re resetting in our lives. And I'm going to open up the altar. If anybody would like prayer, you don't, you don't have to. You can sit in your seat and just commune with God and the Holy Spirit will touch you. But if you if you feel you'd like to come up and, and we pray for you, please come. Um, otherwise, just open your heart to God where you are. Hallelujah. Father, we offer our hearts and our lives to you afresh. We need you to speak to we need you to reorder our lives. I need you to reorder my life, Lord. I need you to just bring a moving of the furniture of my heart. So my heart is true to you always. We all need that. So Father, touch this people, touch this church this morning. Bless them, Lord. Bless Pastor uh, Patrick and Leah this morning, Father. So we just thank you.